cloud is difficult to learn. Cloud is only for techies. Cloud certifications take a long time to do. No, no, and no again. Cloud is easy to learn. And you can do some of the beginner cloud certifications in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud in less than two weeks. How do I know? I'm Ranga Karnam. I'm 10x certified in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud as well. Our courses are helping thousands of learners do their cloud certifications in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. In this series of videos, we'll be focusing on cloud fundamentals. Once you understand the fundamentals of cloud, you will see that learning AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud becomes really, really easy. Are you ready to make learning cloud easy? Let's get started. In this video, let's talk about serverless. If you look at the last five to six years, I would say serverless is one of the concepts which became really, really popular. Serverless actually means a lot of different things to different people. Some people talk about serverless functions. Others talk about serverless containers. There are a lot of people who even talk about serverless databases. And there are other people who calls anything other than serverless functions as not serverless at all. In this video, let's get an overview of serverless and what is generally accepted things around serverless. And we'll also understand how you can do serverless in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. Let's get started. Now, what is serverless? That's what we would be talking about first, right? Let's take the traditional approach to deploying software. We would actually first create a virtual machine. And on the virtual machine, you would probably install an operating system deploy, install your application runtime, maybe Java, maybe Python, or things like that. And on top of it is where your app is running. So typically, whenever we would want to run an application, there are a lot of things we worry about. What is the runtime you would need? How do I install it? What is the operating system that I would need? What is the kind of servers I would want to make use of? And the other things which I would want to talk about are scaling and availability. If there is just one instance of your application, that might be that might not be sufficient to take care of all the requests which are coming in. You might want multiple instances of your application, and you'd want to be able to distribute the load between them. And also, you'd want to ensure that even if one of these go down, you'd want to replace it with a live instance, with a healthy instance. Right. So whenever we talk about deploying applications, whenever we talk about building applications, the first thing which we'd be talking about is deploying them. Where do I deploy them? What is the kind of environment I would want? How many servers? How many instances? What is the hardware? What is the OS which should be present? What is the runtime I would need? So code almost becomes the last part. I will not really think about how to write my code. Right. What I'm thinking about is where I would deploy it. What if you don't really need to worry about anything other than your code? You would worry about your code. You would only worry about a little bit of configuration. And you would pay per use. You would pay for how many invocations which are coming in. That's the concept of serverless, right? So instead of worrying about all these, when we talk about serverless, what we are talking about is we create a simple function. So if you are using AWS Lambda, for example, Right? So you create a function, you create a piece of code. This piece of code can be in any language. It can be in Java, Python, Node, C Sharp, whichever language of your choice. Most of the languages are supported. If it is AWS Lambda, it also supports deploying containers. So you can create a container with code which has any of your languages, and you can actually run it when you are talking about AWS Lambda. And once you give this code to AWS, right? You don't really need to worry about scaling it or you don't need to worry about its availability. All that you need to do is to put the function code in and AWS would take care, AWS Lambda would take care of scaling it, making it sure that it's highly available. And it would make sure that even if there are thousands of requests coming in, let's say all of a sudden there is a very high increase in load. Like there was very less load and all of a sudden it there is an increase in load. What it happens is a number of instances of the Lambda functions are created and it would automatically handle that. So the concept of serverless for me, it's very, very simple, right? So it's number one is 
you don't worry about servers so you don't care about servers all that you would care about is code that's number one rule number two rule for me as far as serverless is concerned is pay for use you only pay for use so you give a function code and you pay by the number of invocations let's say there are thousand invocations you pay for these thousand invocations you don't care how aws is running this lambda function you don't worry about how many servers they are making use of right all that you'd want to worry about is thousand invocations so you'd pay per use if there are 1500 invocations i would pay for 1500 invocations if there are only 10 invocations i would pay for 10 invocations the golden rule i typically use to evaluate serverless is the third one which is zero cost if there is no use at all so if there are no invocations how much cost should we pay it should be zero so when you have zero invocations are you paying zero that is for me a golden test for a serverless service there are a lot of other things which come into picture when we talk about serverless services right so if you'd want to pay zero for zero uh, like zero invocations then like whenever you have a invocation what the cloud platform needs to do is to deploy all that is needed to deploy your lambda function and therefore they would have a little bit of a slow start this is also called a cold start so there are a few problems with paying zero for zero maybe you sometimes you'd need to have at least a few instances extra instances available all the time but like the golden rule for me as far as serverless is concerned is are you paying zero when there are zero invocations or at least is the service providing you a feature where you don't need to pay anything if there are zero invocations that are coming in right so these are for me some of the very very important things that i think about when we talk about serverless right a lot of people actually talk about serverless functions so whenever we talk about serverless the first thing that we talk about is functions and in aws we already saw what the function service is it's aws lambda so aws lambda is the one in azure it's azure functions and in google cloud it's cloud functions so these three are the serverless functions services so all these support all the common languages aws i mean the python java c sharp go so all these support all the common ones and also each of the for each of these all that you need to provide is a code and a little bit of configuration you can configure how much memory you want uh, for each instance of your lambda function each instance of your azure function cloud function and there is a little bit of other configuration other than that all that you need to focus on is the cloud i mean is just the code so that's functions that's the cloud functions kind of a thing right so serverless whenever we talk about serverless typically we talk about serverless functions however we can actually extend the same serverless discussion for databases as well running databases is not easy right whenever you'd want to create a database and you'd want to distribute it across multiple regions multiple zones multiple locations it's a very very tough thing another thing which you need to worry about is ensuring that the data which is present in there is highly available is highly durable right so all those features are needed across databases and recently no sql databases are some of the most popular databases in terms of supporting very very high scalability whenever we want very very high scalability these days typically we go for no sql databases and no sql databases in a way are serverless as well i'll take the example of dynamo db for example or you can consider cosmos db in azure or you can think about firestore this is also called document store actually this is also called data store this is in google cloud right for all these these are also serverless in a way because whenever you're making use of these data, these databases you don't really need to worry about where these databases are being created all that you need to worry about is storing your data so the two operations which 
you would actually care about are storing and retrieving data. You don't worry if it's 10 GB of data you are storing, you are storing 1 TB of data or more. You don't really worry about it. You know that as you store more and more data, the service would scale and automatically ensure that the storage is growing to store the additional data that you are putting in. So you don't really need to worry about where the service is storing your data. And the retrieving part also is very, very important. So you would pay based on how much you retrieve and how much you store. So if you store a lot of data, you would pay a lot. If you retrieve, you make a lot of calls to retrieve the data back, you would pay a lot as well. So you, this is also serverless in a way because you are paying for what you store and what you retrieve. And typically one another serverless database thing I like is BigQuery. So BigQuery is one of the most popular analytics services in Google Cloud uh, with Google B BigQuery as well. Uh, like BigQuery is typically used when you have reporting or very, very high volume based queries that you would want to run. Right. So whenever we want to do reporting, probably you are running reports on terabytes of data or petabytes of data. That's where you would go for BigQuery. And whenever you go for BigQuery, you don't really need to worry about how much data you want to store or how do you retrieve that. All that becomes the functionality which is provided by the BigQuery service. So if you store 10 GB of data, you would pay for 10 GB of data. If you actually store one petabyte of data, BigQuery can automatically scale, store the data in a very reliable, very highly available way. And you don't really need to worry about how BigQuery is storing that data. All that you need to do is to pay for this one petabyte of data. You'll also pay for retrieving this back if you are executing queries, right? So if you are executing, like BigQuery supports SQL queries. So if you are executing SQL queries to retrieve the data back, then you need to pay for the compute which is needed to execute those queries. So with respect of BigQuery, you are paying for storage and you are paying for retrieving that data back. So if you store specific amount of data, you pay specific amount. And the same is case for executing the queries. If you execute a lot of queries, you pay a lot. If you don't execute queries at all, you don't really need to pay anything at all. And BigQuery and these databases also kind of adhere to the zero rule as well. If you store zero amount of information in DynamoDB, Cosmos DB, or Firestore, and you don't retrieve anything back, you would pay very, very near to zero. And same is the case with BigQuery as well. So it's kind of like the NoSQL databases, the analytical databases which are present in the cloud as well, for me, kind of fit the serverless jargon as well. So until now, we looked at the different things which are present in here. So over here, we can probably add in NoSQL databases. You can also add in the analytics database, the BigQuery, and also you can, uh, there are a lot of other services which are running in such a way. For example, queues, right? You would pay for the queues based on the volume of messages which are coming in. These are also serverless services which are present in the cloud, right? So as you, you are saying, like serverless is all about, for me, three important things, right? You don't really worry about the server. You just say, I want to store this data. I want to retrieve it back in this particular way. Or I would want to be able to run this particular function. That's what you would do. You don't really worry about where it's being stored, how it's being run, and all that stuff. So that's number one. Number two is paper use. More invocations, more money. Number three, or more data is stored, more money, right? Number three is zero cost if there are no invocations or if you are not storing any data at all. Now, let's quickly review some of the serverless services in different clouds, right? So AWS, Azure, Google Cloud offer a number of serverless services. So let's type in serverless in here. This web page is very, very useful. So this is something which I constantly refer to whenever I would want to compare services in AWS Azure to the ones in Google Cloud. If you just do a Google for AWS Azure Google Cloud, uh, this would be the page which would come up in the top three results. Like this would be starting with the URL of cloud.google.com. You can go in and check all the things which are presented here, right? So the first one which is listed in is a CI CD build. This is a continuous integration service which is provided by Google Cloud. You would pay for the builds which are running. So that's cloud build. And if you go scroll down, you can see cloud functions, right? This is the functions as a service which we are off, which we have talked about. So this would help you to run your code with zero server management in a pay-as-you-go function as a service approach. 
right? The competitors are AWS Lambda and Azure Functions. If you look at fast cloud function space, I would say AWS Lambda is the leader in there, right? Uh, Google Cloud also calls App Engine as a serverless offering. We can debate that, right? So Cloud Run is the container based serverless offering. If you want to run container in a serverless way, you can use uh, far, uh, you can use Cloud Run in AWS, AWS Fargate in Azure, and you can make use of Azure Container Instances in, sorry, AWS Fargate in AWS and Azure Container Instances in Azure. Um, one of the recent additions to AWS Lambda is that even Lambda can be used to run containers. So yeah, that's a recent thing. And you can see that BigQuery is also in here. This is a data warehouse. Whenever you'd want to have terabytes or petabytes of data stored and you'd want to be able to query them on an ad hoc basis in a very, very efficient way, you can use BigQuery. And also you'd see that there are a lot of services which are listed in here as serverless offerings. In this video, we talked about serverless. We talked about what are the important things that are related to serverless. And we talked about serverless functions, serverless databases. We also talked about the fact that there are a lot of services which are being called as serverless. I'm sure you had a great time watching this video. Do not keep it to yourself. Tell your friends and tell YouTube as well. How do you do that? Like, share, and subscribe. If you're looking to get cloud certified, check out our cloud certification courses in AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. And do not forget to check out the other videos in this series of videos on cloud fundamentals. If there is a cloud topic that you're feeling it's very, very difficult to understand, do post it in the comments and we will make it simple for you. I'm sure you had a great time watching this video and I'll see you again very, very soon. Until then, here's bye from Ranga at In 28 Minutes. See you soon.